Building Champions TV is Faithful Central's new digital library, searchable by time, location, book of the Bible, or inspirational topic. This incredible resource catalogs 40 years of messages into one convenient place. Want to see this week's message? Or watch a message Bishop Ulmer preached 20 or 30 years ago. Subscribe to buildingchampions.tv. It's like our very own Netflix for the family of champions. Remember this one? On this Sunday, three years ago. Sing it. Watch Building Champions TV on your television or personal mobile device and be inspired. $40 per year gives you access to 40 years of transformative content. Visit buildingchampions.tv and sign up today. Gonna go in the house in just a moment. So again, I'm gonna ask that you prepare yourself. Again, limit the distractions. You wanna get focused in on this time of worship, this time of prayer, this time of praise, this time of celebration, this time as we study the Word of God. It's gonna be a great time. It's gonna be a great time. There's a word in the house that we believe, again, will be transformative to your life and encouraging to your soul. Welcome, family, because there's something that God wants to do in your life and through your life. Champion ambassadors are there in the chat. Any questions you may have during service about what's happening or perhaps, perhaps you need more information, drop your information right there in the chat and one of our ambassadors will get to you. But my time is done. The time has come. If you're able, join me. Please stand. Let's worship. Good morning, church. Anybody glad to be in the tabernacle just one more time? This morning, we're just gonna invite you to reflect on God's goodness, on his grace, on his mercy. I can't deny what you've done for me. Loosed all my shackles and set me free. Wrote me and gave me the victory I got a reason, a reason to praise I can't forget what my eyes have seen What seemed impossible I believe Look at my life, we got history I got a reason, a reason to praise I won't let rock cry out for me I won't let rock cry out
you say? Watch this. Cry out, cry out, cry out, cry out. Come on. Cry out, cry out, cry out. This is your moment. Cry out, cry out to your king. All he's worthy. Cry out, cry out, cry out, cry out, cry out, cry out, cry out. Now this is where you get to praise him with the breath that is in your body. There's someone who didn't wake up this morning, but with the breath that's in your body, go ahead and just honor him. Bless his name. Oh, hallelujah. Come on and bless him in this house. He wants to hear your sound. He wants to hear your sound. Oh, hallelujah. God, we bless you. Thank you, Father. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore. Because you deserve it, God. It's your breath. 
bless you. Come on, team. All the earth will. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. So, Father, we lift our voices, our hearts, and our minds unto you, O God, to pour out praises of gratitude, praises of thanksgiving, praises of honor, praises of worship and thanksgiving, O God. For all that you have done, O God, we praise your holy name. We praise your holy name. Rocks shall not cry out for us. We lift our own voices and minds with hearts and gratitude, O oh God, for all that you've done. And then, Lord, when we look at what you're doing and what you've done, we have enough faith to praise you for what you're going to do even before you do it. You have some praisers here. You have some worshipers over here, O oh God. And we bless your holy name. Glory to the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, we ask that you would release the presence and power of your spirit. We ask that you would release your glory in this house today, O oh God. Go up every aisle, down every road. Touch, heal, save, deliver, and set free. Meet us where we are and bring us closer to you, O oh God. Bind every distracting spirit. 
bind every hindering spirit, O oh God. Release the free way for your word to go forth to our hearts and our minds, O oh God, and lovingly draw us closer to yourself. It is to that end that I'm available for you now, O oh God, to use me according to your will. Stand in my body, think with my mind. Speak with my tongue and say to us those things you'd have us know. And do it in the name of him who loved us enough to die for us. It is in the matchless, marvelous, miraculous name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Anybody who's been blessed, come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Come on, bless him, bless him, bless him. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Wow, wow. So once again, the course of culture has shifted and changed. And it's amazing how many divisions there are in this nation. Some are on this side, some are on that side, some are in blue, some are in red. Uh, and yet I have an announcement, God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. There are those who are rejoicing and celebrating that what many would deem to be a wrong for the last 50 years has been made right and that life has been preserved and honored. And there are others on the other side who say, well, uh, life is life in the womb, out of the womb, after the womb, and the lives that we allow to live ought to be lives that receive justice on the other side. So it's just interesting how many divisions and spits there are in this nation nowadays and battle lines are drawn and all that. And yet God never comes to take sides. He comes to take over. And so I pray that you will continue to look unto the hills and realize that God is still God. Amen, amen. It's just interesting to me that a few days before there were those who were grieving and upset because laws had passed to make it harder for guns to be gotten that are killing our sons and our daughters and killing us in schools and in supermarkets and in churches and they were upset about that and then they were rejoicing over life uh, from the womb as my friend Tony Evans say the God of life is the God from the tomb to the womb and the womb to the tomb and so it'll be interesting to see how much legislative action there will be now to protect the babies after they get here and to pour down justice and equality for those who are coming, amen. I, I, I just don't want you to be shaken by the changes and shifts in culture. We're talking about culture today. Some of us are old enough to remember there have been shifts before. Um, and yet God says, if my people who are called by my name God says, if I can get my crowd together. I've listened to reports all week long and churches are divided, religions are divided, and popes are divided, and priests are divided, and yet our God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forevermore. So I don't want you to be shaken by this, uh, but I want you to realize that God is now calling the church to be the church. God will be God if the church will be the church, amen? We're going to learn some things today about culture, about culture, and that's really the platform that I want to move from, the things that are happening today in culture, and yet a timely word, a hard word. I have a hard word today, so for those of you who finish before I do, and if you have to leave before I finish, uh, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we absent one from another. See you next time around, but I have a hard word today, a hard word in the very reality of the culture in which we live. It's a hard word in the context of the culture in which we live. Um, I'm just letting y'all know I had a hard time this week because I, for the first time, well, not first time, but when I was getting ready for this, I realized that I'm old school. Okay. I'm an OG, okay, so. So. So some of y'all, don't write this off because the old man is saying it right off because it's the word of God, okay? I'm going to share some things. It's a tough word today. Amen. Tell, tell your neighbor there's a word in the house today. There's a word. There's a word. There's a word. There's a word. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I, I, I want to invite those of you who can to be, uh, and you have graduates and 
relatives and friends and sons and daughters who are graduating. We're going to have a great celebration here at 3.30 this afternoon, celebrating unapologetically, celebrating achievement and excellence and graduation and moving on. I want you to be here to celebrate with us and to be a part of that. Amen. Um, I, I, I think that, that we are in a time where if we have ever encouraged our young people, never encouraged our next generation, we need to encourage them now. Uh, I'm going to say some things later on today about the culture that they're in today. But so at 3.30 today, we're going to gather for, um, for, um, for the baccalaureate. Those of you who want to join us online. Uh, but tell your neighbor now it's time to give. It's time to give. Amen. No, nobody, tell, nobody said anything that time. Tell you, that was the wrong neighbor. Tell the other neighbor this time. That, that, that was the wrong neighbor, okay? So we come again to our time of celebrating and praising God with our gifts, our offering. How many of you, I'm, I'm old enough to remember this. How many of you remember when you didn't have it to give and you wanted to give? Anybody, am I the only person like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look back and see how far God has brought you in different seasons of your life. And so, yeah, so we come to celebrate the goodness of God. If you don't have an envelope, you raise your hand. Our ushers will serve you if you're here in the room. Uh, the different ways that, we, that you can give online, you can text it, you can download the app and all that. But let it, be, let it be an offering of thanksgiving. Do something a little different this time. However you give, if you're, write a, if you're writing a check or you're filling out an envelope or you're texting or whatever, do it with a word of prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. We see some of the things that are happening in our world, around this world, and wars and rumors of wars. And, uh, and yet, as crazy as this so-called land of the free and home of the brave is, uh, if you travel, you will see that it's one of the best places on, on, in the world, and God has allowed us to be here. And so let it be an offering of thanksgiving. Think of something to thank God for as you give this offering. Maybe you give the offering, thank you. Maybe you're a graduate and you're thanking God for graduating. Maybe you're a, a parent and you're thanking God that your child is graduating. Hey, I got one over here. I'm going to stay on this side the rest of the whole time. Hold on. And so we come to honor the Lord with our gifts. Listen to me. Don't ever give mechanically. Don't, just, don't ever give just automatically and mechanically. Always give with a thoughtful mind. Give intentionally. Give with hearts of thanksgiving of just how good God has been. When you look around and, and you see those in TV and news and those who are struggling for their very lives. There are places in the world, and I've been places in the world, where just to gather and do what we're going to do. We're going to open up the Bible and study the Bible today. I've been in places where people put their lives on the line to do that. And so let it be an intentional offering of thanksgiving. Father, it is in the name of Jesus that we come with hearts of gratitude. We come with hearts of thanksgiving, O oh God. We realize that you are our source. All that we have comes from thee. And we now return back to you as an expression of our gratitude, a portion of that which you've allowed us to control and to, to receive. And we give back to you with hearts of thanksgiving. We give, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Come on, let's praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, put those hands together. Hallelujah. How many of you know you have the power to change the atmosphere? Come on, how many of you know you have the power to change the atmosphere? Come on, we just sang, if you don't praise them, the rocks will cry out. Well, here's your opportunity to give God some praise in the house. Come on, fresh in, say, praise him. Come on, say everybody praise. Everybody praise him. With a loud voice, hey. With a loud voice. Change the atmosphere. With a loud 
heaven feel like you may be wondering what does heaven look like what does it sound like well you ask good questions on a Sunday morning so we're gonna tell you if you ever wonder what heaven looks like it's looking like me and you hey and if you ever question what heaven sounds like Just let it fill the room Come on, help me say it. If you ever wonder What heaven looks like It's looking like me and you Hey, and if you ever question What heaven sounds like Just let it fill the room Come on, one big choir, say, say Say, if you ever Say, say. 
Let's pray, shall we? Now, Father, I pray, pray that you would change this atmosphere, that it might be receptive soil for your word. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive the challenge of your truth. It is to that end that I'm available for you now, O oh God, to use me according to your will. Stand in my body, think with my mind and speak with my tongue and say to us those things you would have us know. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, may your word go forth in power your word go forth to change us and lovingly draw us closer to yourself do that in the name of your son Jesus we pray amen I um, I need you to very intentionally press in and to eliminate any distractions from your mind and heart I, I I have a hard word a tough word and it is a tough word because of the timing of it it is tough in general but it is especially tough in terms of the timing and by that I mean the timing of this present age um, it's a tough word it's a tough word, and so I, I give you that, that, that announcement or that warning even before we get into it. Um, I, I also will repeat the disclaimer that um, I fear that many of you will um, dismiss this word because it's coming... Um, from an OG, okay, okay. Um, so some of you will say, "Well, you know, he's seventy-five years old. No, no I ain't seventy-four years old. Uh, not yet, not yet." Um, and so I realized that that there will be a generational issue here, and I um, I'm trusting the Spirit of the Lord to, uh, to to move me into that challenge. Um, and stand on his word okay um, I want us for the next few weeks to go back and then close out our study in the book of Ephesians Ephesians if you'll come with me to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 I need about need about 20 of you to be praying for me in this message, okay? Uh, if if you will, uh, Ephesians chapter four. Now listen, now listen. Some of us have learned this. We've learned that Paul's pattern of writing. Listen now, Paul has a distinct pattern in his writing, and that is he almost very clearly and distinctly divides his writings into two parts, two sections. He begins with um, doctrine, see, and then he moves to duty. Okay. Uh, he begins in most of his letters, the first section, the first part is about what we are to believe. We are to believe. And then he shifts to the second part of that, whatever book it is, to how we are to behave because we believe what we believe. Okay? And so he, he um, clearly, clearly starts with, with teaching and then he turns to the application of the teaching. Uh, for example, in the book of Romans, the first 12 chapters of that book 
are probably, by some of some have said, is the most profound theological statement in all of Scripture. Those first twelve verse, twelve chapters, and then in the last four chapters, he speaks to the application of those principles, transformed from principles to practice. Okay. Uh, in the book of Colossians, again, four chapters. First two chapters are about here's what you ought to believe. Second two chapters are here's how you ought to behave because you believe what you say you believe. Okay. Likewise, in this book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, six chapters, neatly divided into three chapters apiece. First three chapters are about doctrine, teaching, uh, principles. And then these last three chapters, which we're going to focus on for the next several weeks, Chapters 4, 5, and 6, the last four, 4, 5, and 6, are going to teach us how to live what we've learned. The last three chapters will focus on, now that you've learned this, how do you live out what you learn? I want to put a tag on these last four chapters. We're going to look at it under the, under, under the umbrella of walk the talk. Walk the talk. Uh, again, he's, he's taught us some things that we speak. Now he's going to say, now live it out. Walk it. So pick me up at chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. And he says this. Therefore, listen now. I, the prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you. That's one of his words. He, 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 when he gets to chapter 12, of, uh, of Romans, he says again, I beseech you, therefore. The word means I'm begging you. It means I'm, I'm emphasizing, I'm encouraging you, I'm stressing, I'm pushing you, I'm urging you. And he says, I beseech you, verse 1 now, that you walk. There's our word. Underline that word, highlight that word, put it in italics, put it in highlighter. That's the key word, that you walk, that you walk. That you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Let me unpack that. Paul coined the concept of walking as a description of the character of your life. In other words, you, you don't live life. Uh, his, his, his word for it is, it's how you walk. And so we're going to focus on how do we walk, how do we live. You get that? You got half, the, half, half of the message. It's about how we live. This word is a challenge of how we are to live. And Paul would say you live so that your walk matches your talk. That you, that you, you practice what you preach. That you, that you are to live out what you've learned. In other words, he's saying it's not just enough to write notes in your Bible. It's not just enough to take notes and, and, and it's not just enough, just enough to read it through. He says, how do you apply it? What are you going to do with it now? And that's the challenge that we face in these last four chapters. And so in chapter four, he begins this, he, he, he opens up this second section by saying, I beseech you, I'm, I'm, I'm urging you. He says, I'm pleading with you. One version says, I'm begging you. The one version says, I'm stressing this with all that I have, that you walk a certain way. Paul often contrasts our walk. He, he, he teaches in contrast. He says, we are to walk in newness of life rather than walking in death. He says, we are to walk in good works rather than walking in sin and in trespasses. He says, we are to walk as children of light as opposed to walking in darkness. He says, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. So he contrasts and he compares how we are to walk. And in essence, he's saying, and in essence, God's word to you and me today is, this is how we are to live. Listen to me. This is about how we are to live. And it is about how we are to live now, in the now and now, not just back yonder. But how we are to live today, how we are to live now. This word, this challenge about how you walk is about how you live outside of the doors of this building. It's about how you live after you sign off. You're joining us from around the world. It's how do you live when you sign off? It's about, it's about how you live 
uh, when you, when you uh, take off your choir robe. It's about how do you live when you close up your hymn book. It's about the consistency and the continuity between who you are in here and who you are out there. And Paul says that there ought to be a consistency. We ought to be able to connect the dots between who you are in here and who you are out there. Anybody can be holy for an hour and a half, a couple hours on a Sunday. But, 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 if, but if, someone were, if someone were to take a camera and, 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 and just follow you around for a day, well, for a half a day, for an hour, <laughs> and, and, and just turn the camera on and then press playback, how much would you look like you out there as you look like you in here? You, 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 you got to get it down on that level. Everything I'm going to say the rest of the day is going to be with that idea in mind. It's who you are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, not just who you are for a couple of hours on a Sunday. It is a call and a challenge to live, to walk. Here's the first thing he says. Verse 1, walk worthy. You are to live, we are to walk a worthy walk. Let me set it up. Your life, walk speaks of how you live, your life. So your life is to be worthy. Our lives are to be consistent and congruent with the call of God on our lives. He says we are to walk worthy of the vocation, the call. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But the first thing he says is that our lives are to be worthy. We are to walk worth. He says, listen, there's a call on your life. You, you are to walk, you are to walk worthy of this call. Now, now, now uh, sometimes the word call is used, even in scripture, sometimes it's used uh, to, de to describe your occupation. See, your occupation. Um, anybody got a job? Anybody got a job? What kind of work you do? What kind of work you do? She's in HR, okay? That's her job, okay? Uh, she gets, they do pay you, right? Yeah. yeah. That, that's her job. She, she's called to be in HR, see? see? That's her occupation. Some of you are called to be school teachers, called to be in finance, called to be in business, whatever it is, okay? Called to be entre entrepreneurs, see? Entrepreneurs. See? That's a call on your life. It often has to do with your occupation. Okay, but that's not the that's not the word the way it's, the way it's used here. I, I got accepted at the University of Illinois. I got accepted at the University of Illinois in pre med. See, I was called. Matter of fact, I was going to be a, a brain surgeon. Don't get amazed yet. I ain't told the whole story. Let me. It's a true story. So I got accepted in in uh, pre med, and so I went to campus, and and they gave me they gave me this outline of what I had to study for the next four years. See. Our, uh, <laughs> which is true. I stayed in pre-med two weeks. <laughs> two, two weeks. I went to the registrar's office. I said, I want to change my major. They said, from what? I said, I just want to get out of this. I ain't decided yet, but then <laughs> give me anything other than this, see. I, I thought my calling, see, thought my calling had shifted, see. Anybody ever had a call and shifted? You... All right, all right, I, I got one for you. How, how many of you, if you ain't shame, how many of you got a degree in something you ain't working in now? Yeah, so, so that, that's a call. So you, your occupation may shift, see? But, but there's a call on your life that never changes. There's a call, listen to me, there is a call on your life not so much in occupation because this call on your life is superimposed, or for, uh, superimposed over whatever your occupation is. You are this first and foremost. And you are called to be a son and a daughter and a child of the living God. Listen to me. Listen to me. You are to walk 
in line with that call. There's a call on your life. Um, anybody, do you remember when you got the call? Now, I don't mean, you know, God called you on the telephone. It wasn't that deep. It probably wasn't even an audible voice. But when you felt a tug in your spirit. Anybody? How, how, how many of you, like me, it was in Sunday school when you were a little kid? Sunday school, okay, Sunday school, okay. How many of you, uh, um, say, when you were a kid, you were a young kid, okay? How many of you, after you grew up and you started reading on your own, on the grown, okay? Okay. Is anybody saved in this house at all? Is it? <laughs> Are there any Christians in this house? Listen, 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 listen. But it goes back, you know what it's like? It's like when God gets your attention. You remember when God got your attention? Maybe your life was going in one direction and, and, and he changed directions of your life. Maybe you were going down a wrong road and he got your attention and he turned you around. Maybe you were in the middle of some of the highest points, the, the, the greatest celebrations of your life, the top of your game, and yet you realize that there was something missing. And you heard the call of God tugging at your spirit, tugging at your heart. Maybe it was in the midst of a challenge or a trial or a problem or a divorce or a medical, or a medical problem or, or a financial problem. And in the midst of that, God spoke and God heard, God got your ear, God got your attention. That's the call. Now listen to me. What God says is, live worthy of that call. He says you are to live worthy. Now, now, the word worthy, interesting word, it means, it means... I'll give you a couple of spins on it. It means, uh, it means to live in a matching manner, in a manner that matches the call. Okay, let me say it another way. Uh, it means to live in a way that indicates the call on your life. All right, let me try another way. It means. The way you walk see, ought to match the way you talk. All right, let me say it another way. It means, it means the way you are on the parking lot is the way you are in the pew. All right, y'all ain't got that either. Okay. Uh, do they still say two-faced it? I know I'm old. You said two-faced it. That means you one way. And then when you change it. Uh, it means your manner ought to match your calling. Let me say it another way. It means if you're a child of the king, act like it. It means, listen. It means, listen to me, it means that there's a call in your life and that call ought to be obvious. Here, here's one, here, here's one, here's one, here's one, here it is. How many people would know that you are a Christian if you didn't tell them? Y'all think about that on this side, think about that. One more time. How many people would know that you're a, are there any Christians in there? This is a rough house today, Doc. It's rough in here today. <laughs> How many folk would know that you're a Christian if you didn't tell them? If they just watched you, if they just observed you, if they just listened to you, if they just paid attention to you, if they just watched how you live? Would they be able to come to the conclusion? Paul, Paul says in, in, uh, 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 in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, people ought to be able to look at you and not say a word and just look at you and make the decision, that woman is following Jesus Christ. That man is the follower of Jesus Christ. That brother is a Christian. That sister is a Christian. They ought to be able, it ought to be that obvious. Paul says, Paul says, walk in a way that your walk matches your talk. Let me give it another way. Okay. The word, the word for worthy means, it means, it means in like manner. It means to be balanced. Okay, it's a word used in, in commercial terms of balancing the scales. So he says, your life ought to balance, see, your relationship with God. 
how you live ought to match the relationship that you have with God. He says, when your life is out of balance, you're walking unworthily. You're not honoring the talk. You're not honoring the call. That your life ought to honor the call of God on your life. It ought to match. All right, y'all didn't get that one. All right. It's also a term used in musical circles. It's, it's a musical term. It's a musical term. And it's a term that means to be in harmony. It, the, the, word, the word means that your life ought to be in harmony. See? With the call on your life. All right, all right, y'all ain't got it. Come on, Dwayne, here we go, here we go. Okay. Uh, no, this might not work, okay? So I don't listen. All right, all right Dwayne, give me, give, me, give me three chords. Give me, give me a G flat, A flat, uh, B flat. Okay. All right, uh, Kitty, give me, uh, give me, uh, give me E flat. Give me an F7. Give me a B flat minor. Okay, one more time. Give me a G flat, A flat, B flat. All right, can you give me an E flat, F7, B flat minor? All right, y'all ready? Now play all three the same together. Go. I'm a musician. That hurt my feelings, y'all. As a musician, that just, it's like scratching on a, on, on, on a chalkboard. You know what I mean? uh, hit, hit, give me a B flat, a, a G flat, give me a G flat and an E flat together. Now, hold on, hit it. Any other musicians in the house? Your skin should have started crawling when they played that. Band. All right, give me, a, give me a B flat minor. Give me a B flat chord. Change the D flat to a D. There it is, there it is, there it is. Y'all hear the difference? Y'all hear the difference? Y'all hear that? Somebody say, I don't know what they call it. It ain't Kirk Franklin, so I don't know what it is. If it ain't Kirk Franklin, I don't know what it is. Listen, your life ought to be in harmony. Many of us live lives of dissonance. We live lives off key. We live lives out of harmony. Out of harmony with what God says in his word. God says to listen to me. God says to walk worthy means your life is balanced. And that one side of your life is the equivalent of the other side. Your life in the earth realm is the equivalent of your life in the spirit realm. It means that your life is to be lived in harmony, not in dissonance, not in disharmony, but your life is to be lived in harmony. He says, and in doing so, listen now, you're walking worthy. God, hear me now. God has called you to be mindful of your walk. God, God has called you to be mindful of how you live. And he particularly means, in this next verse, he says, he says, your walk is not only supposed to be worthy, it's to be different. You're supposed to have a different walk. Come down to verse, six, verse 17, chapter 4, verse 17. He says, your life, listen to me, your life is to be different. Your walk is to be different. Look at verse 17, it says this. I tell you this and I insist on it. Underline this phrase. You must no longer live as the Gentiles. Underline that phrase, whatever your, your Bible says in that translation. You must no longer, look at me, it means this. The Gentiles was, a, listen to me, was a symbol of the culture. The Gentiles, was a, they were in a Gentile culture. They were in a pagan culture. They were in an ungodly culture. Listen to me. And he says, you are no longer to live like the culture out there. If you get nothing else that I say today, you get that. Because this culture is jacked up. This world in which we live right now is jacked, it's whack. And God says, house and every day, whatever it is, you ain't supposed to live like that. It's bad English, but it's good theology. It means you're not supposed to live like that. 
He says, you are to no longer live the way the culture lives, no longer live the way the Gentiles live, no longer live the way the world lives. Listen, I know that's old-fashioned. I know that's a tough call. But the Word of God says you can no longer live like the culture. You got to be different. You got to stand out. You got to make a difference. You can't blend in. Some of you are not going to blend in. Some of, you, some, of you are trying, some of you are trying to walk like Jesus, and listen to me, and there are some groups, there are some organizations, there are some crowds, there are some houses, there are some relationships. You ain't going to fit in because God is doing something inside of you that's totally different than the crowds you're trying to get in. They ain't going to let you in. Praise the Lord. Because you can't live like the world. That's not popular. I know it isn't. You want to be liked. You want to fit in. You want to be popular. I got that. But if you're going to live by this book, if you're going to be the child that God's called you to be, you're going to be the woman God called you to be, you're going to be the man God called you to be, you're going to be the student God called you to be, you're going to be the businessman God called you to be, you won't fit in everywhere because God is doing something inside you that is different from the world. God help me today. That's tough. He says you cannot, you can no longer live like the world. Listen, listen to me. I know some of you guys, listen, I know, I know, I know some, some of you guys, this culture is different than me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an OG, I told you, I told you, it's different. But this world that y'all got to live in, this world that my grandbabies got to live in, and your children, and your children's children, you better lay hands on them. You better anoint them. You better pray over them. You better anoint their room, anoint their bed. You better put her all everywhere. Because that world is going to hell. He says you can no longer live like the world. I, 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 I have a niece, I have a niece, I have a niece, I have a niece. Uh, she got blackballed, turned down being in a sorority. Doesn't matter which one it is, the principal. She got turned down Be, because some of the stuff they wanted her to do, she said, I ain't doing that. Right. Hey, I'm a Greek, I'm an alpha, and I'm, I was AK sweetheart, I got all that. But this girlfriend said, I ain't, I ain't that right there, I ain't, that right there. I ain't doing that, I ain't doing that. That's what y'all got to do. I don't need to be in, baby. I ain't coming. I ain't coming. You got to draw a line somewhere and say, I am coming this far and I'm going no further. I'm going all the way in the name of Jesus. He said, listen, he says you can no longer be like the culture. Listen, you are called to live antithetical to the culture. Some of you guys are going to, we got graduations after them. Some of you guys, some of your sons, some of your daughters, some of you guys are going to go off to colleges. You're going to face the greatest challenge to your faith that you've ever seen before. You're going to sit in classes. You're going to be in groups. You're going to be in dormitories. You're going to be in, 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 in circles and stuff that know two things about living for God, little and nothing. See, our problem, our problem, our problem is, our problem is, when we were coming along, at least the culture was leaning a certain way. Now, it, it ain't that it was right. At least the culture, you know, call it Judeo Christian, whatever it is, but at least the culture. Nowadays, the culture can't help you. The culture has nothing to do, listen to me, the culture has nothing to do with the things of God. Media. News, comedy, dramas, and y'all be careful what you laugh at. If they can get you to laugh at it, they'll get you to accept it. All right, y'all didn't get that. 
half of the racial stuff that's going on started off with them laughing at us on television. Because if they laughed at us, they got to at least notice us. If they notice us, they got to pay attention to us. You be careful with some of the stuff that the, that the world puts out to you, that the media puts out to you today. Because if they can get you to laugh at it, they can get you to accept it. Preach, Bishop. The word says, the word says, no longer must you be like the Gentile. Now watch this. Then he says, well, what's that like? I'm glad you asked the question. Come down to verse 19. Come down to verse 19. Watch this. He says, no longer be like the culture. You're to live and walk a different walk. Watch verse 19. It says this. This culture, having lost all sensitivity. What's this world like? Here, here, here it is. It has lost all sensitivity. They've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more and more. I ain't making this up. I'm just reading it. Let me unpack that. He says, this world, listen to me, this culture, this culture has lost its sensitivity. Let me tell you what the devil will do. Let me tell you what the world will do. You, you, you have three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The flesh wants to give you pleasure without God. The flesh wants to give you pleasure without God. The world wants to give you success without God. The devil wants to make you religious without God. Because whatever you bow down to is what you worship. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world wants to give you success, but without God. The flesh wants to give you pleasure, but without God. Sex ain't nasty, is it? rough crowd in here today doctor. <laughs> but the flesh wants to give you pleasure without God the devil listen to me wants to make you religious without God the devil tempted Jesus he says I'll give you all of these worlds if you'll bow down and worship me he says, I'll give you all the kingdoms. One catch. But if you will bow down, now listen to me. The word bow in the, in, in, in the tense is called an aris, A-O-R-I-S-T, aris tense. It's a tense that means at a point in time. Here's what he said. He said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you bow down. It did not mean if you bow down to me. It meant I'll give you all the kingdoms if you If you just bow one time, you don't even have to stay down there. If you just bow one time, he wants to give you success, but without God. God says, God says, this world has lost its sensitivity. Watch this. Loss implies a process. It implies a de -generaliz a, 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 a decentralization. It means, it means that it's, it's degenerated gradually until you lose it. Let me give it to you again. The world didn't just automatically lose its sensitivity. Gradually, it lost its sense. What, what does that mean? Here we go. All right. Peter, uh, 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 Paul writes a letter to Timothy, and he puts it like this. He says this. Their consciences 
have been seared. First Timothy chapter four, verse two. Their conscience, listen to me, has been seared like a hot iron. I know if I can help you. Anybody ever burn your hand, burn your finger? Burn your finger. Okay. And, and when you burn your finger, you lose the sensitivity. See? You lose it. We're gonna look at it another way. Anybody ever got a callus? Got a callus? Uh, I was going to school, met a young lady. She was the first black girl I ever met who played violin. Very talented young lady, had very pretty hands, but her fingers, listen to me, her fingers had calluses. It was on this hand. Her fingers had calluses on her fingertips. She had no feeling in her fingertips because she played the violin. The more she practiced, the less sensitivity she had in her t- fingertips. Well, let's see if I can help you. Uh, okay, don't raise your hand on this one. Anybody ever done something wrong and you knew it was wrong before you did it? Let me work on that. All right. So, you... You say, uh, 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 I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> Any, anybody ever like you resisted it? You know what I mean? And and then you gave into it. What? Well, what? I ain't through yet. And then after you gave into it, you felt kind of bad. Made me feel too bad. Made me feel too bad. You can't feel bad, all right? But the second time, no, man. You don't resist. Watch this. Not only do you not resist as long, you don't feel bad as long. So the second time, and the third time, and the next time, you just do it. All y'all going to heaven because y'all telling the truth. <laughs> Ain't nobody on this side over here confessing nothing. Ain't nobody. Here's the point. You gradually lose the sensitivity. Listen to me. The devil will desensitize the sin sensation. Give it to you again. This culture, this world will desensitize the sin sensation. That's why you do what you never wanted to do, but you did it so often, now you want to do it. They were desensitized to sin. Lord, help me. So how do we deal with that? Let me hurry on. He says, and he uses three infinitives. Verse 22, 23, 23. 22, 23, 24. 23, he says, you must be putting off. Verse 23 says, you must be renewed. Verse 24 says, you must put on. Watch this. Put off, be renewed. Put on. One more time. Put off, be renewed, put on. Now listen to me. New Testament is the only place where you have the picture of we put on Christ. Salvation, salvifically, symbolically, is putting on Christ. Now watch this. It's a a picture of putting on a garment of clothing. It's a picture of being clothed in. So listen. So, So salvation is putting on a garment of salvation. Now listen to me. When you take off the old man, he doesn't die. Say it another way. When when you take off the old clothes, they don't go away. All right, let me see if I can help you. Anybody ever went to your closet 
and you saw some stuff in your closet and you say, nah, I ain't going to wear that. I ain't going to wear that. You know, and that's kind of tight. And, and, and you, you put them to the side and you put your new stuff in the middle, see. Now, you don't throw away the old clothes. You kind of move them to the side. After a while, the other end of that closet starts calling for you. You didn't throw it away. It's still there. Now, here comes the devil. You moved it over there because you picked up a few. But instead of throwing it away, devil talks to you in your mind. Oh, girl, you can lose them five pounds. <laughs> you know you and WW can use them, lose them five pounds, girl. Wait a minute. Then you put it on. <laughs> and you can't breathe. because <laughs> Your mind keeps telling you, if you keep losing some weight, you're going to be able to fit in again. That's a lie out of the pit. You ain't going to go back to that. Put on some clothes that fit you now. That stuff is your old life. That's your old way of living. That's your old routine. God says you got to take it off. You got to put on the power of the Holy Ghost in your life and walk in newness. You got you got you got to live differently. You got to live differently. They've lost the sin sensation. Let me say this in the morning on. Sin is still real. Amen. See, the problem with the new culture is sin is not in the vocabulary. Nobody talks about sin anymore. It's my truth. But the Bible says the wages. One thing you got to give credit, give credit for, for, for sin. Sin will pay you. The wages of sin is still death. I know that's old school. But sin is still sin. And Jesus Christ came to save sinners. So if you have no sin, you need no savior. Your walk is to be a worthy walk. Your walk is to be a different walk. Here's the last one. I'm going home. Let's go, Kenny. It must be a holy walk. Come down to verse uh, 24. Lord, help me. Verse 24. Put on the new man. We talked about that. Created according to God. Here we go. In righteousness and holiness. Thank you, Lord. Look at me. Righteousness and holiness, two sides of the same coin. Righteousness is God's love for rightness. Holiness is God's grief over sin. One more time. You're to walk in righteousness in the things that are right before God. You're to walk in holiness, the things that are aver an aversion to sin. Your walk is to be a worthy walk. Your walk is to be a different walk. Your walk is to be a holy walk. You're to walk, help me Lord, 
in holiness. There's a call of God on your life. Whether you're in school, whether you're in business, whether you're a student, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're graduating, whether you're retiring, God has called us to walk in holiness. The word holiness means to be set aside for God's glory. One more time. What does it mean to walk in holiness? It means to walk in a manner that your life is set aside for the glory of God. So as you walk across that campus, to the glory of God. As you go into that boardroom, to the glory of God. As you interrelate with people in relationships and loves and friendships, to the glory of God. Now watch this. We beheld his glory full of grace and truth. So I'm to walk in truth and walk in holiness. Here's the question I'm going to leave you with and I'm out of here. Does your life tell the truth about your God? Does your life tell the truth about your God? Does your life Tell the truth about your Savior. Your goal in holiness is not so much to be like Christ. Watch this. It's to let Christ live through you. So it's not like me trying to copycat him. It's letting him love you through me the way he wants to love you. To treat you through me the way he wants to treat you. To forgive you through me the way he wants to forgive you. I let him live through me. So that my life, help me Lord, will tell the truth about my Lord. Does your life tell the truth about your Lord? You're a student, you're a son, you're a daughter, you're a business person. Does your career in your career, does your life tell the truth about your Lord? In your relationships, in, in your dating, in your love life, in your marriages, in your courtships, whatever it is, does it tell the truth about your Lord? Do you handle her the way Jesus would? Does your life Tell the truth about your Lord. I'm ready to go. Holiness is what I long for. I want to be holy. I strive, I wrestle, I fall, I trip, I mess up, I get discouraged. But I keep pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing because I want to live my life holy unto my Lord. Everybody standing, everybody standing. Say this with me. Holiness. Is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, Lord, is what you want from me. So take my heart, take my life, take my all, and use me for your glory in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. You've never accepted Jesus the Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't be someone.
someone at this altar to receive you, to pray with you, lead you to your next steps as you make the decision to live your life in holiness. You're watching online, there's a information on your chat and you can say yes to him. It's what I long for. Yes, Lord, yes. It's what I need. In a world, in a culture like this, that's what I need. You never accepted Christ. You may want to join me at this altar. You may want to rededicate your life to a life of holiness. Rededicate your home, your marriage. You may want to rededicate your job, your career. And reconsecrate it unto the Lord. like this if you can if you got somebody in the purse somebody in, in, in your hand just lift one hand like this here's how we're going home repeat this with me here's a prayer Lord holiness is what I long for holiness is what I need take my heart take my mind take my life for your glory in Jesus name amen God bless you see you next week God bless you